Good evening. Welcome to Seeking Truth Catholic Bible Study. Before we begin tonight, I just wanted to say thank you so much if you've ever made a financial contribution to this ministry. Your gifts are so treasured and appreciated. Tonight, Paul tells the Corinthians to not give reluctantly or under compulsion, but that God loves a cheerful giver, and that's what you guys are, and we thank you for keeping us afloat. We just uh, will begin now with 2 Corinthians chapter 1 to 13 tonight. And some scholars say that this letter seems like it's in bits and pieces. It's not as united. <laughs> Others say, you know, Paul had addendums made to this letter as he found out more and more information coming in from Corinth. Whatever the situation was, it's a very autobiographical letter, Paul's most personal letter. He speaks of having mystical visions. He speaks of a thorn in the flesh. And uh, so it's personal. We know that this, he was on his third missionary journey, and it correlates well in the time of Acts 18 to Acts 21. And he penned this letter most likely in the fall of A.D. 56, after he had already written a first letter to the Corinthians earlier that year. Paul had left Ephesus. We did Ephesians last week. And he has traveled to northern Greece into the Roman province of Macedonia. And now he's writing back to the Corinthians, the church he founded there. And remember that church in Corinth had some real issues. If you recall Deacon Bob at the lunch buffet at Athena's temple, uh, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. It was a very worldly city, many numerous temples to little g-gods where they would eat, drink, get drunk, partake in harlotry at numerous temples. And one thing would lead to another. Pressure from the surrounding pagan culture in Corinth was rampant. Idolatry, immorality, rampant. So Paul was telling the Corinthians, you don't have to live by the flesh anymore. You have been baptized with water and the Holy Spirit. And you can live by the Spirit now. You can walk with the Spirit now. And so the current situation at this second letter to the Corinthians is that Paul wants to address some certain missionaries that had ironically been called by Paul the super apostles. Now, that's dripping with irony and sarcasm, and you'll see in a minute. But uh, he starts this section in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 with kind of a, uh, I get the same feel as Ephesians chapter 5, with Christ being the Christ, the bridegroom, and the church of Christ, the blemish-free, wrinkle-free church. Paul says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that Christ, to Christ, I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, or receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent super apostles. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am so not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way, we have made this evident to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin by humbling myself so that the, you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel to you without charge. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you, Corinthians. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. As the church of Christ is in me. This boasting of mine will not be stopped in the region of Acacia. Why? Because I do not love you? No, God knows I love you. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, distinguishing themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of light and righteousness, where whose needs will be according to their deeds. 
Whew. The new super apostles, false preachers, have been bragging about their superiority to Paul in his absence. 2,000 years later, we still have a lot of super apostles out there. Paul had told the Ephesians, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope and you were called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One, 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 that's seven ones, a perfect covenant perfection of ones. This is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And what was Jesus' very final prayer to the Father in John 17, in that beautiful discourse, his final dialogue with the Father before he dies? Oh, that they may all be one, Father, even as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they may be in us. Christ knew Christian unity would be a problem. It's his final prayer to the Father. And 2,000 years later, the Christian body is still splintered. Over 38,000 different Protestant or Christ-following denominations. So his final prayer, oh, that they all may be one, Father, as I am in you and you are in me, that they may be one. And now we have many, 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 many super apostles, over 38,000 different Christian Christ-following denominations that say we don't have to be under the authority of the church. We don't have to be under Christ's bride, the one flesh bride of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. We can make up our own doctrines. We can follow our own rules. We don't have to follow that. We can be our own authority. So we still see super apostles out there. It's an age old, the oldest age old deception of Satan that you can be your own authority. Let's take a look at that. The serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from the tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or even touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. You will be like God. In fact, you will be your own God. You will be God, your own God. You won't need God anymore. You will be self-sufficient. You'll be your own authority, your own God. So it's an age-old deception of Satan, and it seems to work very well. Of these super apostles, Paul said, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He still does it, but he cannot create. But... He once was an angel of light. If you recall, his name was Lucifer, which means in Hebrew, shining one, morning star, or light bringer. He was a beautifully created, pure spirit, angel of God, a beautiful angel of light named Lucifer. And when he gazed upon the beatific vision of the triune God, he thought, oh, I can do better than that. And then there was a war in the heaven, and Michael and his angels were waging war on the dragon. And the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. The accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he only has a short time. He only has a very short time, because Christ will come again. The second coming is prophesied and predicted, and it will happen, and Satan only has a short time. So he attacks any reflection of the Trinity that he possibly can. He can't stand to gaze on the reflection of God. And so he hates 
anything about the Trinity. He hates marriage because a beautiful Christian marriage reflects the Father's love, the Trinitarian love, the outpouring of life between the unity of the couple. And Satan hates the church because the church is that one flesh bride of Christ that produces life, spiritual life to its children in that unbreakable marital bond. Satan also hates the outflow of life, the outflow from the reflection of the Trinity, the fruit of the union of the married couple. And when that Trinity is reflected, Satan hates it. So the dragon is enraged with the woman. Mary, and went off to make war on the rest of her children, the church, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Satan makes war on the church, on marriage, and on life. Because God has a gospel of life. God is life. God is eternal life. There is no death in God. And Satan has a gospel of death. A gospel, uh, uh, his good news is death. His culture is death. His reign is death. He has nothing to do with life. So Paul warned the Ephesians, if you recall, in chapter 6, to put on our battle armor completely every day because our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our battle, our ultimate battle, is against Satan and his dominions. Isaiah 14 talks about this, about Lucifer, when he says, How have you fallen from heaven? Oh, star of the morning, son of dawn, the name, the Hebrew names for Lucifer. You have been cut down to earth. You have been weakened by the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I, I, Satan, I, Lucifer, will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. So Satan cannot create, so he mocks, he mimics, he lies, he distorts, he twists, he's cunning, he's sly, he's crafty, he's deceitful, he's the accuser, the condemner, and he disguises himself as an angel of light. And that's exactly what happened to Eve that day in the garden. She came upon Lucifer, the angel of light, and he deceived Eve. And when God came looking for them, Adam, where are you? And Adam replied, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So right away we see Adam, he's been caught red-handed and he rationalizes and he blames. He blames his beautiful wife, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, Eve. Why does he do that? And what does Eve say? Eve is much more honest with God. She says, Lord, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's exactly what happened that day. Eve was not a bad person. God had made Eve the climax of all creation, the mother of the living. But she got deceived by Satan. Beware. Eve was deceived. Another angel appeared to Mary many years later. And remember, Mary is the undoer of knots. That angel's name was Gabriel. And in the Hebrew, Gabriel means man of God or God is my strength. A lot different than Lucifer, which means I am the bringer of light. Gabriel means God is my strength and a way different outcome. Eve's response to the angel of light, Lucifer, brought spiritual death to all the world. But Mary's response to man of God, God is my strength. Her yes, be it done unto me according to your word. Her yes brought life to the world. So we see these super apostles are boasting of their own power, their own ministries. They're very critical of Paul. They have their own gospel. They're copying from the other collection of the church Paul started, and Paul must respond in this letter. So in 2 Corinthians 11, he says this, but whatever anyone dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? Well, so am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I love Paul, and I love to hear him read out loud. 
I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I've been shipwrecked at night, day. I've been adrift at sea on frequent journeys, in danger from the rivers, in danger from the robbers, in danger of my own people, in danger with the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brethren, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there's a daily pressure upon me with anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I'm not weak? Uh, who, is, who is made to fall? And I'm not indignant? Uh, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I do not lie. So Paul is saying to the Corinthians, have these guys done what I've done for the Lord? Have they suffered? Have they gone through the hardships I've gone through? No, they're just here speaking eloquently and taking the collections and preaching a false gospel. And you're going to fall for this? These are the super apostles. They are false. They are being deceived by the angel of light. So what's Paul going to boast about? His sufferings, his sufferings for the sake of Christ and the gospel of truth. He'll boast in his weakness. He'll boast in his hardships. He'll boast in his turmoils and, and, and his, tra his difficulties in travel. He says, I'm weak. I'm weak. I'm, I'm a weenie. I'm, I have to depend on the power of God, the things I've been through for his name's sake. I have to depend on him. And when I'm weak, when I'm weak in my own ego and in my own strength, then, then I'm strong in Christ. I know it's the power from him. I know I'm not doing this on my own. I know it's his spirit of life that empowers me. And he has said to me, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Such a powerful message and such a juxtaposition of what the world would think. Then Paul goes on to talk about earthen vessels. And he says in 2 Corinthians 4, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That brought me right back to creation story of Genesis when he says light shall shine out of darkness because we know the whole Trinity was present right off the bat in the first lines of Genesis. And God said, let there be light. And there was light because the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit was moving over the surface of the waters, the primordial chaotic waters. And God said God spoke the word. God said, and the word is Jesus Christ, and he said, let there be light, and there was light. Whenever water and spirit are together in the Bible, it's creation, a new creation by the power of the word. All things were made through the word, through Jesus Christ. All things were begotten through him. John tells us in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness can't understand the light. Light always overcomes darkness. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who was close to the Father's heart that has made him known. And so Jesus came, and he offered back to the Father the absolute, perfect, final sacrifice of himself. And remember in John 6, when he told him the difficult lesson of the Eucharist, that they would eat his body and actually drink his blood, and half of them left. And he said, oh, man, does this offend you? Well, what happens when you're going to see the Son of Man ascending back to where he was before? And that's happened now. <laughs> is, is the Spirit that gives life, says Jesus Christ. It is the Spirit that gives life. 
I will not leave you orphans. They didn't want him to leave. I won't leave you orphans. I promise you. He said in that discourse in John 16, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going back to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the counselor, the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will convince the world of sin and righteousness and judgment of sin because they do not believe me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The prince of the world, Satan, will be judged. His head will be crushed on the cross. He will have no power over death anymore or sin. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear to hear them right now. But when the spirit of truth comes, says Jesus, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So Jesus dies on the cross. The water of baptism, the blood of the Eucharist gushes from his side. And 50 days later, that Holy Spirit of truth is unleashed on the earth to all tribes, all nations, all tongues, all people, all of Abraham's children. And John tells us there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three all agree it's a perfect testimony. That spirit of God now indwells our earthen vessels by that indelible seal of your baptism, by that indelible seal of your confirmation. We may be earthen, but we are created by a master potter, and we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of the living God. We have a treasure in earthen vessels that surpasses the greatness of power. It's from God, not ourselves, that we would boast. And a vessel is a beautiful thing because a vessel is created to hold something. So when God molded you and fashioned you, he made you in such a way as you were a vessel meant to hold something, meant to contain something. You're meant to contain the Holy Spirit of the living God. Back in the olden days, in the days of antiquity, what did the earthen vessels hold? Either water or oil, and both were very, very, very crucial to life. An earthen vessel is made of the earth. It's made of clay and water. Remember, man, you too are an earthen vessel. You were made of dust, and unto dust you shall return. Our human lives... Our earthen vessels are very fragile, and they are temporary. If you take a big earthen pot and crack it on the cement in the driveway, drop it, it shatters into 100 pieces. We're all different kinds of pots, different shapes. We have different cracks, different chips. Life takes us in different directions. We're used for different things. But we hold something. These jars held water. Water was crucial for every society, for life. They carry the water of life. In the garden, we know that river of life was the Holy Spirit hidden all along. When man is banished from the garden, he's banished from that river of life. But God has a plan. It's plan A all along. But the plan contains two covenants. And that first covenant will start with some jars at the wedding feast at Cana, some great big earthen vessels. God's going to usher in the new covenant through his son, Jesus Christ, and his mother who go to a wedding, the wedding feast at Cana. John's a day counter. On the third day of the fourth day, on the seventh day, it's a new creation. A seven is perfection of this new covenant. There is a marriage feast in Cana of Galilee, and Jesus was there. There were six jars, six earthen vessels full of water for the ritual purification of the old covenant. Six is one less than seven. Six is not perfection. But the six will be used and the fulfillment will be the new bridegroom, Jesus Christ. These earthen vessels that hold the water of the old covenant will be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit into the new covenant. On the seventh day, 
the sixth earthen vessels will be full of new wine by the power of the Holy Spirit. It will be the first sign that Jesus does in John's gospel to prove his divinity, to prove he is Lord, and the apostles and his mother all know. The earthen vessels hold the new wine, the best wine, the Eucharistic wine, and they use the six old ritual purification vessels, but they fill them with new wine by the power of the Holy Spirit in a new covenant on the seventh day, a new creation. You will recall that John's baptism was of water only. And the uh, Ephesians said to Paul, Paul said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? And they said, no, well, we haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So they didn't know yet. And then Paul baptized them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So water will go to spirit and fire when the new covenant is ushered in. Same with the jars. The water goes to the new wine by the power of the spirit. And it's Eucharistic wine and it's the best wine. So from water to the Holy Spirit, we are baptized into the full trinity in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, just as we were commanded in the final commission in Matthew chapter 28. What was lost in the garden, we're going to come back fully into full communion with the Trinity by the power of the Holy Spirit. So these earthen vessels will hold different things, water and the Spirit. And then life happens. So you're a beautiful earthen vessel created by a master potter for God's glory to contain something. And then life happens. We get wounded. We get cracked. Look at this pot. Look at this pot. It's a crack pot. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's damaged. Life is hard. We have trials. We have tribulations. We have sufferings. And we get a lot of cracks in our pot. Then what good is that? Can that hold water anymore? It's going to leak all over the place. But if you're full of that Trinitarian love by the power of the Holy Spirit, then your cracks can radiate him all the more because he shines out through the cracks. I love this painting because the light of Christ is shining out through the cracks. I've heard it said in heaven that when we get our new glorified bodies, all the scars of our lives will radiate the light of Christ and will be transformed into an beautiful vessel. The more scars, the more you've united yourself with Christ and he shines through you, the more beautiful. Look at this pot. It's been so cracked in life that you can barely see the pot. It's just shining, just glowing. The radiant love of the Holy Spirit shines through. And so we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God will, will be of God and not from ourselves. Paul knew that. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's the mystery of redemptive suffering. Paul's so good on mystery. That's it. We carry the body of the dying Christ in our vessels so that his radiant radiant light of the resurrection and power of the resurrection can, sh can shine through. The saints knew this. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to the death of Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our mortal flesh. I have a friend who has had way more suffering in life than anyone should have, and she's learned to pray with the crucifix. And all her woundedness, all her pains, all her brokenness, whatever's bothering her, she writes on a little piece of paper. Then she takes the piece of paper, and as she's praying with the Eucharist, usually before, um, w with the crucifix, usually before the Eucharist at adoration, she'll take the little pieces of paper and rub them into the wounds of Christ as she prays. I give it to you, Jesus. I unite it to you, Jesus. I surrender to you, Jesus. And there are his open arms showing her his great love for her. And when she unites all those, she's, she's being healed by this prayer time. And then she can tear up the pieces of paper and not worry about them anymore because she's given them all to Christ. She's united them with his suffering. And there's power there. There's great redemptive restorative power. That's that mystery of redemptive suffering united to Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. We can't take the cruciform away. 
we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. Uh, you see the juxtaposition between the Protestant cross, the happy resurrection cross, Christ is risen and gone, versus the Catholic cross with the bloody corpse, the suffering Christ on Good Friday. <laughs> but Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Gentiles foolishness. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We can't get rid of the cruciform Christ. The beauty of being a vessel, uh, because a vessel holds something, a vessel contains something. So let's talk about that again. We went through it with water. Let's go through it with oil because they had these little oil lamps, very common all over the place in first century Palestine, the main light source. And Paul said, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So we have these little oil pots. These little, light, these little lamps, and light shines out of the darkness. You pour oil into the earthen vessel, you insert a wick, and voila, light. You know when you have a power outage in your house how dark it is, and you're looking for flashlights and candles. Well, we are these lamps, these earthen vessels, and when we're filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit, our light can shine and light up the whole world. We are an earthen vessel made of clay. We're very fragile, but when we're filled with the Holy Spirit and his oil, what was Adam made from? Adam was made from the dust of the ground. The Lord formed man, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. I love to think of God breathing into the nostrils of man the breath of life. He's made from the dirt and from the breath of God. And what is in breath? Breath has moisture, little droplets of water, and the spirit of the living God. Again, water and spirit come together to make life a new creation. And the first man was named Adam, and he was a beautiful creation. But Adam falls in his flesh, and he is banished from the garden until, until he can be filled with the Holy Spirit and enter back into full communion with the Trinity again. We, too, are an earthen vessel made from clay and the breath of God, <laughs> filled with the Holy Spirit now by the baptism that he offered us in the name of the Trinity, filled with oil, the Holy Spirit, to be a new creation. And this oil does not have to run out if we live ready, if we live ready to meet Christ. And Christ used this example of the wise virgins. The kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent, wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil in their flasks, along with lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delayed, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Get us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. But the prudent said, no, there won't be enough for us and for you too, so go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him and went to the wedding feast, and the door was barred shut. Later the other virgins came up saying, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. <sighs> be on the alert then. For you do not know the day nor hour. Whoo, the wise virgins have their earthen vessels full of oil. They were ready to meet the bridegroom. That oil in the earthen vessel, to me, is the oil of the Holy Spirit. Their bodies were earthen vessels, and they must have been full of the Holy Spirit and ready to meet the bridegroom. And they're let in to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. How do you keep oil in your vessel? How do you prepare to meet the Lord? you got to live ready to meet the bridegroom, to develop a relationship with the bridegroom. You don't marry a man you've never met. <laughs> Jesus is the bridegroom. No one else can do the relationship for you. You have to get to know him. It's your personal relationship with him. No one else can do it for you, and I can't do it for anyone else. I can't make the relationship happen for my kids and Jesus. I can't make it happen for my husband and Jesus. You have to spend time 
I have to spend time getting to know my bridegroom. And that's prayer. That's what prayer is, getting to know him, talking with him, dialogue him, listening to him, listening to his word. And then you got to get to know the whole family. If you're going to marry someone, you got to get to know the whole family. <laughs> that would be the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the love that flows between them, that perfection of love. And that's what prayer is, taking us in union with the Trinity. That prayer is our relationship with Christ. And I can't give my oil away. I can't give my relationship with Christ to someone else, even if I'd like to, even if I'd love to. I can't. It, and, and that's why those virgins couldn't give their oil to the other ones. They weren't trying to be mean, but they couldn't give. I can't give you my relationship, the oil of the Holy Spirit in me. And that oil ignites us and makes us shine like a bright light to the rest of the world. How much fuel do you have in your earthen vessel right now? <laughs> what happens to a car or a lawn lawnmower with no oil? My dad made us check the oil every time. If I don't have oil in my engine, I'm dry. I won't run. I won't purr. I'll burn out. Check your fuel gauge regularly. Are you burning brightly with the fire of his love? Or are you bone dry with no oil in your lamp? That oil is the Holy Spirit. That oil is your prayer time. You need more oil? Go to the Eucharist. Ah, be in communion with the Trinity. Any chance you can get. More grace from the sacrament of confession. From the Trinitarian anointing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are absolved of all your sins. The convictor, the Holy Spirit. Are you sharing your light or laying low? Because Jesus says, does anyone light a lamp and then put it under a bushel basket? No, he puts it on a lampstand so they can give light to the whole house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see the good works that you do and glorify your Father in heaven. So keep that lamp burning brightly. Trim your wicks. Spend time in prayer. Keep your oil full. Obey his commandments. Watch. Be alert. Be ready. Wait. Be patient. Because you're dust. And unto dust you will return. We're fragile earthen vessels, and I can tell you without any doubt that no one is getting out of here alive. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The main mode of, uh, of um, housing were tents in the Mediterranean at Paul's time. In fact, you'll remember Paul was a tent maker. But tents aren't eternal homes. Tents are temporary. Tents were meant to be moved. You know Paul made tents with Aquila and Priscilla in Acts 18. He knew tents were made with human hands, but he knew if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. A house not made by human hands, eternal in the heavens, is the heavenly tabernacle of God, the new Jerusalem, where the true presence, the beatific vision of God is. We have known about God's heavenly dwelling place, his tent, his tabernacle for a very long time. In fact, Moses was told by the Lord to choose Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Ur, from the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. Filled him. This is very unusual in the Old Testament to be filled with the Spirit of God. Who is this Bezalel? Well, he's a 13-year-old young man. He's a 13-year-old kid filled with the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. God must have a very important job for Bezalel. Bezalel's parents were her, and his grandmother was Miriam, Moses' sister, meaning Moses was his great uh, uncle, and Caleb was his great-grandfather, and his name in Hebrew means shadow of God. Now, what did God have designed for him to do? See, Said the Lord to Moses, I have chosen Bezalel. I have filled him with the spirit and with knowledge and understanding and, and, and wisdom, all these gifts of the spirit. What is he to do? He's to make the tent of the meeting, the ark of the covenant with the atonement cover, all the furnishings for the tent, the table, the articles, the pure gold lampstands, all the altars of incense, the burnt off, everything, everything, this kid. And rabbinical literature tells us by virtue of his profound wisdom, Bezalel succeeded in erecting a sanctuary which seemed a fit abiding place for God who is so exalted in time and space. In fact, the candlesticks alone, Moses had a hard time comprehending. God showed him a vision what they were to look like twice. 
And, and, and he told Bezalel one time what the Lord, and Bezalel, boom, immediately knew exactly what they were to look like because Bezalel was in the shadow of God and full of the Holy Spirit. He was chosen to make the tent of God, the exact replica that Moses had been given on the mountain, Bezalel was to craft on earth. So this is spoken about in Hebrews chapter 8. The Levitical priests serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. For when Moses was about to erect a tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern which is shown you on the mountain. And that's what Bezalel did. He made that tent and the Lord said, this tent of the meeting, this shall be a statute forever to be observed through all generations by the people of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel would encamp around the tent of the meeting. They, uh, everything revolved around the tent of the meeting. This was the place where God would meet man. The tent of the meeting is where God meets man and speaks to man. The cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The spirit of God was there, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And after the apostasy of the golden calf in Exodus chapter 32, Moses himself the most humble man on the face of the earth gave up face time with God to intercede on behalf of the sinful people. I'll just tell you briefly that Moses went up on the mountain to get the second set of commandments because he had crushed the first set. And the Lord said, I'm so mad at the people. Let's just you and I go off, Moses. Let me destroy all these people. And Moses, no, 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 Lord. No, Lord, take me, not them. You, you must come with us, Lord, because if you don't go with us, uh, what will distinguish us from any other nation? We need you, Lord. And the Lord said, I will go, Moses, but you will no longer be able to see my face. They used to talk face to face like a man talks with a friend. But now Moses would have to hide in the cleft of the rock and the Lord would pass by. And Moses could no longer see God face to face. But Moses gave up that face time on behalf of the sinful people to intercede on their behalf. And the Lord was well pleased with Moses. And so when Moses came down with the second set of commandments, his face was glowing. As the Lord passed by him, he was radiant with the glory of God. And the people were like, oh, oh, he's so bright. Shut him off. And Moses veiled his face because his face was the uncreated light. It was, it was so radiant that people couldn't ha hardly stand to look at him. And so he veiled his face in humility. And Paul tells us, Paul tells us that in the new covenant, this, uh, Moses' light was fading because the old covenant was fading, because the old covenant was never the ultimate. The old covenant was a lead in to the new covenant. And so Moses' face was fading as the old covenant was fading, but Paul says now the veil has been lifted and we can see God face to face. And so Paul used that to explain to them. He used the meaning of the place of God, the tent of the meeting, which housed the true presence of God in the desert. Later in history, when they had a more permanent dwelling place, Solomon built the first temple and there was the Holy of Holies where they could house the true presence of God. It was the holiest place on the face of the earth. And when Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory of the Lord filled the temple so much so that the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the temple that glory cloud, that Shekinah glory. And when they returned from Babylon and started to build a new temple in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, Zerubbabel built a new temple. The people cried. It was nothing like the first temple. And at the time of Jesus, they had been working on a new temple. Herod the Great, Herod the Great, the grand architect, had been for 46 years working on a magnificent new temple that would house the true presence of God. Only one problem. The true presence of God was nowhere to be found because the Ark of the Covenant was missing. Jeremiah, it tells us in 2 Maccabees 2, had hid the Ark of the Covenant in a cave and the cave was sealed and the cave was never found. And so there's no Ark in the Holy of Holies at the time of Christ. The true presence of God is missing from the temple. What was in that Ark of the Covenant that was in the Holy of Holies that was in the tent of the meeting? Three things, Hebrews tells us. A golden urn of manna, which is Jesus Christ, the bread of life. 
Aaron's rod that budded, which is Jesus' iron rod of authority, and the tables of the covenant, which Jesus Christ himself is the new covenant and the fulfillment of all. So the true presence of God is here in the form of Jesus Christ. So when man of God, Gabriel, comes to Mary, Mary becomes that new tent at the meeting. She's the Ark of the Covenant. And she says, be it done unto me according to your word. And she says yes to the Lord. And she becomes the tent of the meeting where God will meet humanity in her womb, incarnate flesh of Jesus Christ. A cloud comes over her. That Holy Spirit cloud overshadows her and the glory of the Lord fills her temple, her body. Her body becomes a new temple of the Holy Spirit. And like Moses and like Solomon and the Levitical priests, Joseph will not enter the tent of the meeting because the glory cloud of the Lord fills the tent and no one could enter. St. Joseph is her chaste spouse and God will give him the grace in their sacramental union, in their marriage, in the primordial sacrament. He'll give him the grace to not enter the temple of the Lord. The true presence of God is back in the temple when Joseph and Mary take baby Jesus to the temple for presentation and they see Simeon and Simeon is full of the Holy Spirit and he knows now I have seen salvation, now I can die. He knows by the Holy Spirit this is the light of the world to the Jews and Gentiles. And Jesus can't stay away from the temple. He is the true presence of God and he always wants to go back to the temple. At age 12, his parents can't find him. And he said, didn't you know I'd have to be in the temple? In my father's house, he was drawn to the temple. They were astounded. The scholars, the, the elders, they were astonished. And when he comes back in John 2, in John's gospel, he's driving out the money changers at the temple because zeal for his father's house consumes him. The true presence of God is back at the temple, Jesus Christ. And his body is the true temple. He tells them, and they'll understand later. The true presence of God is back in the truest temple when he ascends back to the Father and sits at his right hand. As Hebrews 10, 12 tells us, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And now through the Eucharist, we become that new temple. We, through baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, reconciliation, we take him into our body and our bo Paul says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We become the meeting place of the living God. Here, indeed, we groan and long to put on our heavenly dwelling so that by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we sigh with anxiety, not that we would be unclothed, but that would we be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, eternal life in the heavenly tabernacle. So we start off with original nakedness. They were naked and unashamed because they had no sin. They were in right relationship with the triune God. And then when they fall, his greatest mercy is to clothe them with animal skins, to clothe their sin temporarily until he can solve the problem through these two covenants yet to come before they're banished, they're clothed. Then in his mercy, he clothes us now with a white baptismal garment of salvation. But this isn't the final garment. This isn't what we're yearning for. That's not the ultimate clothing. The ultimate clothing, Paul says, is this, this. The funeral pall, the white salvation garment that will cover our casket one day when we finally go home, when we're done with this temporary tent down here and we go to this heavenly tent up here and we're reunited with the beatific vision, the full triune God. This is what we're longing for and groaning for and waiting for, for why we are still in this tent. We sigh with anxiety, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, eternal life. We're longing for the new Jerusalem, the heavenly dwelling place, the heavenly tabernacle and the spirit he's given us as a guarantee. But <laughs> we've never seen it. We sure hope it's true, because Paul even gets that. He says, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home right away or make it our, we just make it our aim to please him, we'll get there one day. He knows we will, because he says, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all of us.
so that each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. Be ready. Live ready. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 